All right, so our next speaker is a entrepreneur and author and is the VP of Invicta Medical and Active Valen. Uh, her, research, or her focus point will be on the convergence of exponential technology, disrupting medicine, therefore enabling patent-driven healthcare. And as a uh, nice little personal note, she played competitive varsity hockey for six years oh, yeah. while playing, quite amazingly, at 85 pounds. <laughs> One tough lady right there. So uh, speaking with uh, the talk of Patton as CEO, ladies and gentlemen, Rom uh, Robin Farman, Farman, <laughs> sorry. Don't worry, we got there we go, all right. How's that? Can you hear me, guys? Everything. All right, cool. So I'm going to stand here because if I stand there, I'll need a stepladder for you to see me. <laughs> so yes, I'm Robin Farman Farmian. Give you a little background on me. My life goal is to positively impact at least 100 million patients worldwide. That's a pretty audacious goal, right? So I decided to hack a career together that doesn't exist. I'm working now on three companies. I am called the money girl, right? So I raise money and I do the high level business development for companies that are poised to impact at least 100 million patients worldwide. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm working on curing cancer uh, with Actavalon. We're repairing P53, which will be able to cure more than 50% of all cancer. I'm working on Mind Maze, which is a $2 billion unicorn. It's virtual reality for stroke and brain injury rehabilitation. And I'm working on Invicta Medical, which is a data-driven platform sleep apnea medical device. So these are pretty hardcore things and pretty hardcore diseases I'm working on. Well, you know when you hear someone as crazy as I am saying, yeah, I'm going to help out try and cure cancer on the side, you know there's a backstory. So with me, at the age of 16, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease. All told, I have had 43 hospitalizations and six major surgeries. Now, when you're facing surgery, and especially when you're a kid, right, you go from hospital system to hospital system looking for the very best doctors out there. But none of my doctors ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin, let's hold off on these surgeries because you're so young and technology is moving so quickly. It could provide better solutions in the near future. Nobody ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin, technology is hope. But Technology is hope, right? In fact, had digital health IT and just the sheer amount of information we now have access to as patients existed when I was a teenager, I most likely would not have lost three organs. Now at the age of 26, this is seven years after they had taken out my entire large intestine, my doctors were telling me I was cured. <laughs> but I wasn't, and I was in extreme pain. So over a period of years, they kept upping and upping my opiate dose until eventually I was on 80 milligrams a day of methadone. Now this is a massive dose, and we were talking basically heroin dependency at that point. And I went back into my doctor's office and I said, I need off this drug now, it is a horrific medication. They said, okay, well the next step would be to surgically implant a morphine pump into my spine. I was like, are you kidding me? I was 26 years old. I was essentially a shut-in. Just being able to take a shower was the most thing I could do on a daily basis. And my doctors were telling me I was going to be on high-dose opiates for the rest of my life. So I basically said, F you. And I fired my entire healthcare team, every single one of them. And I rebuilt it with healthcare professionals that worked with me as a team and a colleague. I ended up getting diagnosed correctly, put on a biologic medication IV called Remicade, and literally within 24 hours of that first dose, I went into remission, totally overnight, after 13 years. So that's what I'm up here to talk to you about, and that's why I've dedicated my life to dramatically impacting medicine. I talk on the convergence of exponential technology, let's see if I can do this, uh, impacting medicine. So when I'm talking about exponential technology, I'm talking about all the sexy ones, right? Artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality, sensors, even being able to utilize the power of the crowd. So today, let's start out with a scenario of what it's like to be a patient today and in the near future. Well. Right now, we have a lot of point-of-care diagnostic devices. What that means is a diagnostic device that comes to the patient versus the patient having to go to a traditional setting like a hospital or clinic. So what I can do is take my FDA-approved EKG monitor 
on myself in my home, send the data up to the cloud where it's going to be analyzed by artificial intelligence. And if I do need to see a physician, I can do one via telemedicine. Skype, FaceTime, even potentially a telemedicine robot. In fact, that is the way right now the United States is going, massive into telemedicine. In fact, Kaiser Permanente, that is the country's largest managed care organization. Their CEO came out last year in California and said, by 2018, more than 50% of all of our clinical visits are going to be done virtually. CVS Minute Clinic, you can walk in there anytime and see a registered nurse on demand. They've recently partnered with Cleveland Clinic, one of the best hospital systems in the US, and you can now see a video doctor on demand from CVS Minute Clinic if you need one. There are many, many examples. In fact, almost 70% of in-clinic visits actually don't need to be in-clinic. And point of care diagnostics, or what I like to call diagnostics on demand. We are seeing a lot going on in the world of blood collection and nothing to do with Theranos, get that out of your mind. <laughs> so this company right here, the Core Wellness Tracker, this is essentially a hacker type tool, right? Because it's not going through FDA approval. They did a crowdfunding campaign and they're expected to launch in the next couple of months. You can get a spectrometer in your own home now for a couple hundred dollars. You can do cholesterol levels, blood glucose fasting, uh, things like even inflammatory markers on a daily basis if you'd like. Everlywell, they just did about $3 million of funding and what it is is mail order labs. So you just go online, you order a kit. This is out of pocket, by the way. This is, this is really hacking your healthcare. You're not going through insurance. You're not going to doctors. You are self-prescribing lipid tests, uh, thyroid. You can get every single one of the STDs done through Everlywell. They send you a blood collection kit. You take surface level blood, send it back in the postage paid free envelope and bam, you've got your own blood lab. We're also seeing a lot going on in the world of apps. Uh, BrainCheck launched earlier this year. This is early detection of dementia and concussion. Now, why this is so important is because, with, especially with dementia, pharmaceutical intervention is only successful at the early stages. But the problem is none of us get baselines on our brain health. We all know our baseline on our BP. We know our baseline on our cholesterol. Nobody knows their baseline on their brain health because you don't go to a neurologist until you're exhibiting symptoms. Once you're starting to have symptoms of dementia that are actually impacting your life, it's probably too late. So this is a gamified version. It's a freemium model. So for free or for a couple hundred, you know, a couple dollars a month, I think, subscription, I can do a game for five to 10 minutes that will give give me my brain health. It is fun, it is engaging, and you don't have to go to the doctor. <laughs> Everything on this slide is actually FDA approved. These are clinical grade medical devices that are affordable and able to get as a patient. You do not go through the healthcare system to get these. You do not go through your doctor. You do not go through your insurance company. Stethoscope and the ear monitoring device, they use your smartphone as the brains. Hook right into it. Look in your kid's ear. Take your own, uh, you know, use your own stethoscope. And if you do need to see a physician, you can do one on demand via video through their apps. I talked about a live core, that's the EKG monitor. It's a single lead EKG monitor. The ultrasound, this is interesting. Philips came out and it is a subscription model. So now for $300 a month, anybody in the country can get their hands on an ultrasound. That is incredible to someone like me because they usually cost thousands and thousands of dollars and you can only have them in hospitals. So say you're pregnant or you just need an ultrasound for a couple of months, you can do that with this, with this particular device. And this is me. This is me in my own living room. I have hacked my healthcare in order to get almost every single bit of it in my apartment or within a two block radius. I get my Remicade every six weeks now for the past 18 years, and now I'm doing it in my home. It went from being $28,000 uh, a, a dose, by the way, at Stanford to only $5,000, and that goes through my insurance company. So my deductible fell from about 1,000 to about 500 by doing this, and my recovery time went from seven days to zero. That's how much of a big difference it makes when you pull patients out of things like infusion clinics. I also do IV uh, saline solution on demand. I mean, how many people have had a hangover in their life? Raise your hands. There we go, right? So you can next morning, and this is in a lot of the major cities here in the United States, including Vegas and San Francisco, New York, Boston, IV doc, it's like Uber. You go on an app, you order a liter of saline solution, a vitamin B12 shot, and some vitamin C IV. They come to your house within two hours. 
and it's paid out of pocket, right? Doesn't go through insurance, doesn't go through your physician, but if you're hungover or if you're someone like me, I have Crohn's disease, um, I need a hydration frequently, so I can just get one on demand. In fact, I even get my primary care done in my home. My doctor at a Circle Medical, uh, and there's other companies, that one happens to be in the Palo Alto, San Francisco area, they come to my apartment for 60 minutes. 60 minutes, $20 copay, and they take care of everything. When is the last time any of you saw a doctor for 60 minutes? Pretty big deal. All right, so back to our scenario. We had our point of care diagnostic, we sent the data to the cloud, we saw our physician via telemedicine. What about potentially getting our medication delivered by drone? Well, this is actually happening. Company called Zipline, $18 million of funding based in California. They have gone into Rwanda. It is one of the poorest countries, of course, in the world, and their infrastructure for transportation is nothing. So one of the biggest killers there is maternal bleeding. Oh, and that's, that's solved purely by a blood transfusion, but they can't even get that in Rwanda. So Zipline is in there. They've partnered with UPS. They are creating the world's first completely nationalized drone delivery system, specific for healthcare. They do things like blood transfusions, vaccines, and medication. White House went to them a few months ago and said, Zipline, we need your help. So they are starting out here in the next year, uh, actually in the state of Nevada, and I think uh, part of Virginia and one other state in the, uh, in the country where there are remote patients who don't have easy access to doctors. And we're gonna start delivering drone medication in the next year here in the United States. We're seeing drones being utilized in other areas of medicine. This is a flying defibrillator. If you can get to a heart attack victim in under 60 seconds, you can increase survival rates from 8% to 80%. Massive change, right? And one person, ambulances. This is essentially a flying car. This is real, this exists. This one is about a year and a half old, actually. Uh, it's a company based out of China, and they are talking to Lung Biotechnologies, a transplant company here in the United States, for 1,000 units of these. In fact, countries like Dubai are starting to launch this for consumer travel, like taxis. In fact, the drone industry is exploding. Last year, as you can see, it was about a $2 billion market. That is expected to grow over the next three years to a $127 billion market. Have you ever seen a market just expand in that quickly? In fact, right now we're entering a perfect storm of technological advancements, really enabling what I like to call the era of the patient. So starting out with the medical science, we all know genetic sequencing is not only on the exponential trend, but it is dramatically outperforming Moore's law. 2001, it cost about $100 million to sequence the genome, and it cost about $2.6 billion to get to that point. Last year, it fell to the under $1,000 mark. That is the inflection point experts have agreed would make a massive difference in medicine. We're going to start to see things like precision medicine, a tre treatment plan based on the individual versus the one-size-fits-all model that we have had up until now. That is a big deal. We'll also start to do early onset diagnostics and predictive analytics. All right, go to raise your hands in the room. How many people have heard of the microbiome? Awesome, okay, it's about that, I get about 50% in most of my talks. So what the microbiome is, it is it colonies of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live in and on our bodies. Totally symbiotic relationship, by the way. We need them to survive, and they absolutely need us to survive. Well, genetic sequencing technology is catalyzing sequencing the microbiome, because it's actually even smaller, so now we need to start sequencing the microbiome on our bodies. And this is going to, you're gonna to start to see this a lot more in the news over the next five years. The US government launched a $400 million initiative last year around sequencing the microbiome. 100 million coming out of the Gates Foundation and a lot of academic institutions have, uh, have gotten on board with this. Let me give you some scenarios on how we can look at treating diseases. I have Crohn's. Imagine I bank my microbiome the same way you bank umbilical cord blood and get a transplant back when I'm not feeling well. Or take that one step further, all of us in peak health bank our microbiomes. And then if we get cancer, take antibiotics, or just start aging, we can get a transplant back of our own microbiome. Now, we are already using something called fecal transplants for C. diff. C. diff is an incredibly difficult antibiotic resistant infection, and that is actually cured now with microbiome treatments. All right, so let's talk a little bit about software. So virtual reality and augmented reality, this is both software and hardware, but the software is the big part of it that's driven by artificial intelligence. And I mentioned I'm working in this space as well. Right now, I mean, the obvious uses of virtual reality, gaming, entertainment, experiences, you wanna go diving off a 
you know, Mars, whatever you want to do, you can do by VR. And training. We have been training the military and surgery and disaster response now for a couple of years. But interesting things that we're going to start to see pop up over the next 6 to 12 months. Trying on makeup, trying on clothes, test driving your cars, interior design, architecture, doing all of your meetings and going to school in the world of virtual reality. But virtual reality and medicine is where I get really excited. This is me, I'm working on, a, I mean, I'm just trying out a company called DeepStream. This, they're based out of Stanford and they are for pain management control and it actually works. You put on the VR, you're in there and you're shooting penguins and there's snow flying. I have five. And, uh, and um, it it's actually works. We're also using it for things like pain anxiety, pain, anxiety PTSD, uh, even phobias. If you're scared of spiders, you can now get rid of that phobia in the world of VR. And virtual reality is going social. There are six to seven major platforms already. Uh, one is called High Fidelity. Spaces launched recently. That's Facebook's version. But imagine Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn in the world of VR. All right, so factors to consider. A couple billion dollars, again, was invested in the next last couple of years. These are mainstream VCs. These are not niche VCs. Now, we are going to start to see it democratize, as I mentioned, over the next 6 to 12 months. And that is because of two companies. First, Apple. Uh, their 10-year anniversary is coming up uh, with their iPhone 8 is launching. And it's between September and March. You'll probably be able to get your hands on it. It's going to have a heavy AR focus. Second one, of course, is Facebook. With the launch of Facebook Spaces, this is a big deal. This is why they got Oculus Rift. And I have about two or three minutes left, so I'll skip over hardware. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a lot of content. I could have done this easier. All right, so all of this technology, though, is raising the bar on the interaction between the patient and the physician. So if you think back to the title of my talk, The Patient as the CEO, and just like the CEO of a corporation where you surround yourself with a fantastic array of vice presidents, support staff, advisors, remember, as a CEO of a corporation, you are not an expert in marketing, engineering, right, finance, legal department. You hire the best experts. So as a patient, why not? Why should, you, why should it be any different? You can be the CEO of your own healthcare team, but you hire all the best experts to give you advice on what to do. You are the one who is the decision maker, and you are the one who is, uh, who is essentially responsible to making sure that your healthcare is gotten to you. And I understand not everyone is as type A driven as I am, very obviously, ice hockey player for six years for Boston University. This is a pretty big deal. Um, so I talk about having a COO on the team, health coaches, and we're seeing this as an industry massively explodes, both virtual and in person. And so health coaches can help you, and they don't need to be skilled in medicine, they just need to be skilled problem solvers. Because a lot of the time in medicine, maybe why you're not getting your treatment plan isn't because you don't understand it or isn't because you don't want to do it, but it's because you're 70 years old and your driver's license expired, you have no idea how to use Uber, and you don't know how to renew it, so you have no way of getting to the doctor. Well, people like health coaches can help figure out how to incorporate and integrate treatment plans into your specific life. So I want to leave you with this thought. Now that you're the CEO of your own healthcare team, and I mean every single person in this room, you are now the CEO of your own healthcare team, how are you going to start to change your behavior today? Thank you.